everybody. This is Bob from Music Store Live, and today I have the great pleasure to speak with Randall Smith of Mesa Boogie. And uh, this is all part of our Gold Rush 2014 uh, promotional giveaway. And uh, Randy, thank you so much for spending some time and talking with us today. My pleasure, Bob. Thanks for inviting me on board. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, where are you speaking to us from today? Well, I'm speaking from you to you from um, my home office here, which is the uh, my main workplace. This is this is the adjoining the home of Tone, which is the factory, which is right down the hill from uh, where I live. So, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do most of my work up here and um, still be able to uh, zip down to the factory. Uh, in about uh, well under 15 minutes on a backcountry road, and um, join in on all of the collaborative efforts that go on down there. It's 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 a great combination. Oh, that's that's very nice. That's nice that you're able to kind of uh, be away from the office, but also not be too far from it. Um, that's actually pretty closely tied in with the you know first thing I was going to ask you, which was. You know, even just like setting up our interview, I could tell, you know, you're a very busy guy. you got a lot going on, obviously, all the time. Um, you know, you're you're a prodigious amp designer and builder and tinkerer extraordinaire of sorts. Um, and it seems to us like you don't probably get a whole lot of time to sleep with how much work you have to do. So if you wouldn't mind just walking uh, folks through what a typical day in the life uh, of Randall Smith and Mason Boogie looks like. Hey, I'm getting old here, and uh, you know I got to take a little bit better care of my bod, or I, I don't have the energy that I used to have. <laughs> uh, so yeah, sleep. Um, <laughs> I've discovered I need to hit the pillow, you know, no later than 11 or so. Otherwise, I can't uh, maintain well my full energy. I like to get up right around seven or a little bit before. I, I must say I'm sticking to a pretty good routine. I, I have to do a little exercise in the morning, and that usually followed by a swim. Mm. Uh, the best part here in the summer is I've got a little lake that adjoins my office. In fact, it's you know four feet from from my office door, so I can go out there and jump in and paddle around for a while. And uh, that uh, helps clear the fog. Actually, I've had some great ideas while swimming, too, some solutions to some problems that are really, uh, you know, it's, all right, that's just, no, you can't do that. That's never going to work. It's impossible. And I'm swimming around. It's like, wait a minute. And then the light bulbs start to come on one after the other, and then I can get out. And uh, <laughs> I think one time I didn't even bother to dry off. I had to come rushing in because I got everything right here, see. So yeah. The, uh, you know, there's not a great degree of separation between um, between living and work until it's time to eat. That's another thing I like to do. And, uh, <laughs> so um, I do pause for my three meals a day, and um, shoo, I don't know what I can tell you, but uh, I'm really fortunate to be doing something I'm passionate about, to have found something uh, in life that I really love doing, so there, it, it doesn't really feel like work a lot of the time. I mean, sometimes it does. Obviously, you got to do stuff that you'd rather not do. But the key sure. for me for that is to get out, get that stuff out of the way first, um, if you can, at least, or let it pile up until uh, it goes away by its own uh, accord. Because uh, I really like to stick with the creative um, side of it. Obviously, that's what's always kept me interested. And um, I'm really fortunate to have such a great crew of guys, some of whom I'm sure you know, that um, handle all the day-to-day -day stuff, which is enormous. It's it's uh, it's amazing. When I go down to the factory and walk through there, it's, it's sometimes uh, you know I'm 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 amazed and and almost frightened. It was like, wow, this is this is. <laughs> There's so much going on down here. I'm glad I'm not in charge of all of it. But they make it easy because they, you know, their line is, "Hey, boss, you keep designing them, we'll keep building them, and we'll keep selling them." And uh, you know, we, we just a bunch of great guys, the guys you'd you'd want to hang around with, uh, and we do, you know, when you're not at work. So, yeah. once again, it's more like a band than a company, really, is the best way to put it. So, um, I had a great time when I go down there and, and uh, hang out with the guys. That's 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 kind of what it sounds like. It, it's a real, you know, um, I mean, nobody nobody does it all on their own, and you always have to have a, a great team in order to to make great things happen. And um, absolutely, you know, you you look at the history of uh, 
of Mesa and the amps and the amps that you know you have um, conceived and designed. Maybe some of them in your lake, maybe not. <laughs> and um, you know, and, and it kind of uh, that kind of ties in actually to uh, the next question that I have for you, which is you know, yeah, the sound of of, of the Mesa amps. You know, it's um, you 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 invented and and you continue to define the sound of a uh, a modern day high gain American guitar sound. And this is um this is a sound that we hear uh a lot in modern music. You know, um when you hear a Mesa amp on a recording or if you're at a concert, you know, a lot of the time if something might catch your ear and you know, I can look up and I can tell I'm gonna be listening to a Mesa before my eyes hit the stage. <laughs> and then um I mean besides besides the fact that that's just like really you know, must be very cool uh, to know that your creations like add that much to the like tonal palette of American music, um, you know, I'm kind of curious, like what what your perspective is on just that that sound, like the American tone, and uh, how your work over the years has come to help shape that sound. Yeah, well, um, as you know, I started out as a repairman. And actually, I was a drummer in a rock and roll blues band. And um, when it was discovered that I could actually fix stuff, um, <laughs> then that uh, led, you know, more or less directly to uh, to all of this stuff. I've always been fond of Fender stuff because it was just, you know, it always sounded the best in bands that, were, that, uh, that we were playing in. And in terms of working on it and looking at how it was built, it was just the standard. It was just the right way to do stuff. Yep. Now, having said that, I listened to all of the complaints that various musicians, uh, guitar players, had. Oh, and there was one other uh, pretty, pretty important development at one point in our in our in our band's career here. One of the bands it was after Clapton came and played Winterland with the brand new, you know, Marshall stacks. And so, what does uh -huh. our guitar player do? He goes out and buys a freaking Marshall stack, which. <laughs> totally obliterated any kind of balance that we were you know previously able to get out of the band because again he's oh i have to turn it up loud to get my tone and it was like yeah but you're driving everybody out of the club including us jeez man yeah, right. <laughs> yeah so th that that became one one uh, element right there and that was actually started before i was even getting into repairing and knowing what was all going on um, we moved. Our first little store was in Berkeley, California, where I was going to university and uh, studying, majoring in, uh, you know, chasing girls, smoking dope, and playing in a rock and roll band. But uh, I majored in some of those. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, that's part of the college career. I spent the first year <laughs> hopping freight trains, actually, and uh, from that experience in writing about that, I was uh, I was ushered into these. Uh, kind of elite little uh, creative writing classes at uh, Cal Berkeley, which was a perfect opportunity to goof off, man, because when it came to yeah. anything like hardcore science, oh, count me out, I don't have a chance. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so after a while, we um, we decided, well, I'll tell you how this happened. We we were working, the keyboard player, Dave Kessner, and I were running this little dinky store in Berkeley that mainly sold our own band gear and fixed stuff. And luckily, uh, that was his idea. It's like, let's open a, a, a music store because you can fix stuff. And in no amount of time, all of the leading Bay Area bands were bringing truckloads of gear in for me to uh, to maintain. And I thought it was, you know, part of my professional background that I needed to, you know, how everything worked, and that helped underscore why I liked Fender amps because if you fixed them, they'd stay fixed. That's when I came up with the the, the famous hammer test too, realizing, you know, what a what a mechanical beating this stuff takes on the road. I came up with this idea, like, well, uh, and this happened when I saw the first truckload of gear from Country Joe and the Fish show up. Oh. By the way, let me tell you, now there is, an, uh, there is a band that is faded into obscurity, but in the day, yeah. uh, uh, they, they were huge. Uh, let me see, I'm trying to think of the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the band that, that just blew my mind that opened for them. Yeah, Led Zeppelin used to open for Country <laughs> Joe and the Fish. <laughs> I like that. No, that's, that, that that's, that's precious. <laughs> yeah. When their equipment 
truck arrived. That was a seminal day, and I never forget it because this big burly guy, who was the guy that encouraged me, by the way, to do the first uh, little Princeton mod, as he was telling me, he said, "You know, this stuff takes a real beating, and we're going on a long tour, and I want it all to checked out." And as he opens the back door to the truck, a showman head falls out <laughs> and lands <laughs> on the street, and he says, "See what I mean?" Yep. And uh, so from that, I got the idea of this hammer test, which is, well, I'm going to just wail on this thing with a hammer until something breaks and then fix it and, and you know, wail on it until you can get it so that nothing further breaks. Okay, well, that was good in terms of the reliability. The only problem that had was that after I'd fixed most of the fenders in the entire Bay Area, the, the repair business started to drop off because they weren't breaking like they used to. All right. But I was listening yeah. to these guys. um and one of them was Carlos Santana. After we moved over to Mill Valley, we got sick of all the riots in Berkeley and the tear gassing and stuff going on. Mill Valley was just a, like this peaceful little redwood, charming town right across the Golden Gate Bridge from from San Francisco. And mm -hmm. um, it turned out that was a real haven. Uh, a lot of, lot of players lived in and around there. Uh, including this guy named Carlos Santana, who was relatively unknown, almost completely unknown, and he was just one of the guys that hung around at our prune music because it was a you know it was a social club as much as it was a music store, maybe more actually. Sure. And uh, he kept telling you know he, he he kept saying, man, I need to get more sustain out of my amps. I I, I need to <laughs> be able to play a note and have it hold and ring out. And uh, around this same time. One of these guys named David Faison, the other guy was Gary Jackson. They were basically the roadies, which is what they were called in those days, Tex now, but they were the roadies for Country Joe. And they said, hey, let's play a, let's play a trick on Barry Melton. Can you take this little Princeton and just jack it up to some ungodly performance level that will just blow his mind? And, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. Because I'd already been into the sports car craze when I was a uh, you know a young reprobate, and uh, I always liked the little British sports cars, but wished they had you know small V8s in them. And so that was the that was the image of okay, I'm going to drop a yeah. small block V8 into this Princeton. Right. And of course, you know where that led. That yeah. in combination with Santana going meh. Last night I hit this note and it just died and and I felt like my dick fell off in front of everybody. I hope he doesn't mind me <laughs> quoting him. This was a long time ago, but <laughs> I got the image <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, that's got to suck. That is no good at all." That, that's so, a bummer, man. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and I can understand that. Now backing up a little bit, my dad was a professional sax and clarinet guy, so I grew up hearing saxophone, and you know you you can sustain a note forever on a sax, uh, or at least as long as you can hold your breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and and the same with a violin. Obviously, they're slightly different tones. Well, could be completely different tones, but they have a lot of overtones. And that idea about being able to carry a note and you know and milk it is. is is seductive, and that's what Carlos and I were, were talking about. Because I said, "Oh, you mean like a saxophone? Yeah, 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 like a sax or a violin, where you yeah. know you're breathing through the uh, through the instrument, and 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 it's part of your voice." And I was like, "Yeah, that's all. That's all great stuff. The great imagery for, uh, and you know, Carlos is the king of great imagery too. So this is all sure. great stuff for trying to trying to figure out sound." Okay, so. I've done this little boosted Princeton, and it, it was a whale of a success. In fact, Carlos was the first guy to try it out, and he's the guy that came up with that name Boogie. When uh, you know, I had to I had to convince him to try it after I would boosted it because I kept it totally stock looking. And I said, Hey, man, would you play through? He was just hanging around. I had it working, but nobody had played through it yet. So I dragged it out to the front of the store. He was hanging out. I said, Hey, would you mind plugging in? Oh man, it's just a Princeton. I don't want to play through that. No, no, I've done it. Try it out. <laughs> You know the story. So he yeah. wailed through that, and you know he, he he was inspired, and you know that's how he lives. Is he he goes from one inspiration to another, and we ended up, you know, it was a summer day. We had the doors to the shop open, and the crowds just started stacking up out in front of the store while he's going off. And, that's a good time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And at the end, he, he, he puts the guitar down and looks at me and he says, shit, man, that little thing really boogies. And so that just became the name of the operation, which was, you know, get your Princeton boogied kind of thing. And, you know, that led, 
that I love how Carlos Santana just seems to pop up at all the right times throughout rock. Well, he sure did in in my life, and me and his too. I must say, um, it's been an incredible collaborative experience. Well, it comes back, you know, what forty years later with the King Snake reissue, which was terrific. When he called me up, it's exactly. not like we hang out all of the time. We're, I'd say we're pretty close friends, but we can go for a couple of years without seeing each other, and and you know, sure. and we hit, and then we just take off because we got so much shared history together. Yeah, it's uh, really good. Am I rambling on too long here? Are you trying to keep this short and sweet, or what? Cause oh no, no, it's fine. I'll I'll tell you when we have to go if we need to. But <laughs> I mean, I but I, I was I was gonna I was gonna bring up the King Snake amp, so I, we might as well just get into it. Um, you know, I I spoke to Carlos uh, just a few weeks back, and we had a wonderful conversation about music and tone and and guitar and and you know approach and all those wonderful things, and and we talked about the King Snake amp and. Um, you know, uh, wh- you know what he said to me was just that this thing. You know, you really nailed it. You know, he was he was checking out the old old uh, I think archival recordings or footage of the Budokan recordings, yeah. and and he heard that sound from the early '70s, and it was just like you know, wow, that's that's it right there. So, you know, he's obviously of the opinion that you know you just n- nailed this thing out of the park with the King Snake amp. So we wanted to say you know congratulations, and but we wanted to ask you. You know about that process sure. of, of recreating that sound. There's so there's so much recreation in music these days. So what was what was your favorite part of that process of recreating that that sound that you know, like to use your words, just really inspired the heck out of him? Yeah. Um, well, two parts. First, um, just having him call up out of the blue and and sound so passionate about that amp, and then me not remembering uh, which amp. You know which one? I've made him lots and lots and lots of amps over the over sure. times, and uh, so when I finally got a look at it, it was like, oh man, yeah, I kind of, I actually kind of do remember this one because it was, it, it, it is really prehistoric, is all I can tell you, but it did have so many of the features uh, already there um, that. Well, they're basically our signature stuff. And once again, standing on the shoulders of Fender, you know, it's just sort of like the hot rod guys. You know, they all stand on the sh- on the shoulders of the small block V8 these days, or, or the big block in some cases. When I was growing up, those were the new engines, and and most of the hot rodders were standing on the shoulders of the old Ford Flathead. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you don't start from nothing, you know, and everything everything is a continuum. But with that amplifier. And, and and what I've been able to figure out uh, over the decades I've been doing this, well, let me digress a little bit. It's one thing to make an, a magic amp, and I don't want to I don't want to uh, diminish the difficulty or the importance of doing that. But it's actually harder to to consistently make magic amps. To make them yeah. all have that magic, that is way harder than just wow. Listen to this amp. This one sounds yep. incredible. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Why does it sound incredible? Okay, and right. you can copy the thing exactly, and it won't sound the same. <laughs> I yeah. think we all know that. Everybody, again, with Fenders, uh, there's yep. there's a few great ones, a few doggy ones, and all the rest of the ones in between. Yep. And yet, you look at them; it's the same parts, it's the same circuit. What what's up? So yeah, and we a little bit of the the voodoo in there. Exactly, a whole lot of the voodoo in there. But that's something that we d- we have devoted ourselves to over the decades. And I'm I'm not at liberty to share with you what we've learned. But going <laughs> over the uh, going over the king snake, we were able to confirm it too, and and that's why we could duplicate it again. It w- because it was more. Than, I mean, obviously we had to do. Uh, we couldn't get the exact same capacitors uh, that were used because they're they're no longer being made. But we uh-huh. we listened to what five or six different kinds, and it turned out that the best was one of the kinds that we were already using in some of our amps. Um, and we use different parts in different places in different amps, depending on what kind of sound we're going for. But if we're going for a, a, a more vintage. Uh, legacy sound, we will use older parts like carbon comp resistors, more of those and, uh, and, and you know and a different kind of uh, capacitor construction than if we're going for newer ones. Same thing with the transformers. All of that stuff matters. So one thing that we did was that 
we still had, and we didn't want to take Carlos's amp apart at all. We wanted to keep it exactly as it was without messing it up. Oh, good. Uh, of course, and uh, as the reference, but we had another transformer just like it, and we basically had it blueprinted by our transformer engineer, and uh, he was able to actually get it to comply with the modern safety codes while keeping it exactly the same, which was a really good thing. They just have some increase about creepage spaces and stuff like that that have to do with uh, uh, safety, you know, bullshit mostly. You know, it's stuff that really <laughs> seems like it to me. Um, but, you know, because a lot of these safety uh, regulations emanate from Europe, the famous IEC 60065, and they, they just go overboard. They don't even want you using transformers like we have that, that are paper core, paper paper insulation and all that. But you got to do that to get it to sound right. They want it to be nylon and Delrin and, and on coil forms and, you know, all of this stuff where it, you, you just can't get it if you build it that way. Huh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's why we like working with this guy, because he knows what we're all about, and he's willing to make dozens of samples with incremental tiny changes, you know, along the way so that we can evaluate them all. And, uh, and, and so He was able yeah. to reproduce this without, without, um, without having to deviate too much from the original structure of this transformer. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he may have just falsified the records for all I know. I don't want to ask him too much, but, you know, he signed <laughs> off on it, and that's all we needed. No, I'm sure he did it right. He's a, he's a, he's sure a professional. Sure perfectly safe. His, yeah, his license would be on the line if he didn't. But, uh, you know, and, and bear in mind that the original transformer was UL approved anyway. There, there was never any, it's not like this is a dangerous thing ready to burst into flames and electrocute you. There's no right. possible way that any of that can happen. You know, and we've had this conversation with underwriter laboratories when we're complaining about their ridiculous stuff. I said, okay, show me how it's possible to either start a fire or get a shock from this. And he looks at it and he says, it's impossible because it's steel, it's fully enclosed, and it's grounded. And I said, thank you. So <laughs> your yeah. concerns about fire and safety are completely addressed. And he says, well, yeah, but... Then they go further. Any anyway, rate, I don't want to bore you. We're getting off topic. But all of these little details matter, as well as the stuff that I'm not at liberty to tell you about. So it was gratifying right. for us that we were able to do this. And the reason we were able to do this goes back to that amp we did decades ago, the dual rectifier. That was the one where the first proto had this magic tone that we weren't able to duplicate. It took us nine months before we could get another amp that actually sounded the same. And, and what I'm talking about is the layering of the harmonics being the same, the same harmonics layered in the same way. That's what we're talking about, not you know something that you can see on a scope. If you ran uh, the, the frequency curve and all that, they're identical. But if you listen to them, they're not at all. Like One of them is... <laughs> One of them is just magic, and the other one just, and the rest of them just aren't. And they come to that same distribution of, yeah, they're real good, but they're not as good as that one. And here's one that's not real good. It's the same thing that everybody deals with, no matter who they are. When you listen to their amps, they're they're all over the place. It, so, this is like, this is stuff that, um, you know, like you're saying, you can't see on a scope. In, in fact, it's the kind of thing you can only really measure by um, you know, the hair on the back of your neck. That's a not. perfect description of it. That's exactly right. And also the reaction of the player uh, when he when he's playing the amp is is it fighting him or is it is it is it uh, releasing him? You know that's something that we go into great uh, lengths to to get an amplifier that actually enables you to quote play above your level unquote. Um, by removing the barriers, and you know how that is. That's a, a great guitar does that. A great instrument uh, always yeah. will do that and let you play uh, above your level. So, and it's always that's another thing that I find interesting. And that was something about the Carlos amp that he the uh, the the King Snakes and its predecessor was. He said it's got this incredible dynamic envelope. It just every note goes pwa pwa pwa. You know, and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, that's what made it so inspiring to play. You can't measure that. It doesn't show up anywhere. Well, that's like one of the things I, I said to Carlos, uh, who we talked a few weeks ago, and I said, you know, you're one of those, you're one of those players um, whose, whose sound, for me, is so personally and instantly recognizable. And, of course, 
you know, uh, however much percentage of that is is just him and his hands and his his fingers, and then there's the instrument, and then here, there's the amplifier. But you know, I said to him, you know, I can when I hear a recording, I can tell it's you playing in the first. You know, I, all I need is maybe two notes to tell if it's you, and maybe I need about three or four notes to tell if it's somebody who's just trying to sound like you. <laughs> and and uh, but of course, you know, it's it's this trifecta of the player. Yes. Uh, the instrument and and the amplifier, and uh, and you can't really you can't really lose one from that equation. You know? No, it's um, the uh, it's again it's the collaboration. And uh, well, once again, Col- Carlos and I were really fortunate to intersect as we did when we did because yeah, yeah he had a smoking band, but uh, it wasn't until Bill Graham um, took him under his wing. Yeah, uh, and he did the Abraxas and a couple of the great albums that he really became the international star that he was that 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 he became. And what Graham said, what Bill Graham said is, yeah, there's tons of great guitar players in the Bay Area, but you've got an individual sound that's immediately identifiable. And yeah. I love salsa, and you're as close to salsa, you know, as like <laughs> salsa rock. <laughs> Okay. All right, Bill Graham. <laughs> yeah, go Bill. And so uh, when Carlos started touring the world, now you got to bear in mind, I was, um, I w- it was a similar deal in that Prune Music was this store in Mill Valley, but I was living in out in a shack in the Redwoods about uh, 20 miles away. And I was doing most of my work out there in the shack because, like yeah. I mentioned, Prune Music was basically a social club, and if you went in there, you'd be considered rude if you didn't, you know, throw down with the fellows and, and, you know, smoke their latest weed from Hawaii or Thailand or wherever. And then that kind of, like, made it a little bit hard to get the work done. So Yeah, not getting not getting as much work done in that situation. I know. No, definitely not. But uh, so here I am, this you know, basically this this hermit out in the woods. And, and suddenly, as Carlos is touring the world for the first time, I'm starting to get these inquiries from all over the world. It was just like, man, Carlos... His, this sound, that little snakeskin amp, that tone, man, and, and you know, and suddenly from Japan and Germany and Italy and all over the place, there are people. Hey, I want to, you know, I'm, I want to buy these. I want to import these and all that. So, um, so that's that's how that collaboration goes back. But yeah, just to that's stick fine. to the, stick to the point here about what was the most satisfying part. Well, actually, telling you about it right now is about as satisfying as as any of it. But, <laughs> Going back well, I mean, it, I, I'm sure it's it's got to be hard to put your finger on just one thing because it's it's such a marvelous process that it, you know it started, you know, back then and and just continues to you know in, inform your work and and add to it, you know. So it's it's what a wonderful process it is. I'm sure to just re, kind of regale. Oh, uh, it's gratifying. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's really yeah, it's it's truly rich and cool. I'm blessed. Well, let me let me. Uh, well, I'll change gears to only slightly, just for a moment. Now, I, as I understand it, you know, and, and most people know this, maybe not everyone, uh, that you know, you grew up not playing the guitar, but but playing saxophone and piano. And um, I'm kind of well, I don't really want to, you know, necessarily a- ask you about you know your earliest years of playing music necessarily, but I do want to know about you know the earlier guitar sounds that turned you on or if it was a favorite amp design but more so I'd, I'd rather kind of focus on um, what uh, kind of music would you say or it doesn't have to be music but sounds you know that you encounter in the world uh, most influence your kind of concept about tone and you know lend themselves into your building process um it's a kind of um, polar opposites here because on the one hand, again, like you mentioned, my background is acoustic instruments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is funny. My dad didn't consider a guitar, particularly electric guitar, a legitimate instrument. <laughs> he, <laughs> he just didn't get it. it, it you know, I, he, he was from another era, let's just put it that way, where guitar, sure. you know, if there was a guitar, it was a guy just banging out rhythm in the background. It certainly wasn't yep. anything like blues or rock. And he was a he was an educated professional musician, you know, well-schooled and all of that. So he just had a whole different outlook to it. 
Having sure. said that, the acoustic sounds were what I kind of grew up with, and and he introduced me to jazz at an early age, and it's never it's never gone away. So one of the things uh, that that I've that's always um, resonated deepest with me is, is acoustic jazz from the uh, from the 50s and, and uh, early 60s, largely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do you combine that with guitar? Well, um, you know, one of the things that makes guitar so interesting is the amplifier, because it's the amplifier that determines what sort of style of music the guitar is producing. And as you know, it can be everything from sitting around the campfire uh, like uh, playing uh, and country music coming from that um, all the way up to the heaviest, hardest core metal and industrial sounds. I get a kick out of all of them, to tell you the truth. If they're, if they're well done, they all make me <laughs> smile and grin if it's just badass. And one of the other tones, now the total opposite of the organic vocal tone that we this is one of them we we strive to achieve again santana it's almost like that saxophone vocal singing crying wailing tone but another another one that i really go for is extreme machinery dragster motors a, a big oh. v8 a big v8 dragster motor or even a smaller v8 uh there is an overtone on the good old american v8 that is just killing and and I don't know if it's a if it's an open fifth like a power chord. I believe it is because that's what it sounds like. Okay. And um, it's just mighty. That's all you can say is it's just. Um, and so I, I can go from one end of this really delicate vocal intimate sound to the shit, man. This is this is like nuclear holocaust over Manhattan, man. And that just that lights me up just as much to you know to put this stuff together. And I feel almost like that guy. Uh, you know, the, at the at the at the drags who who can tune those motors and get them to just so it's just a controlled explosion, you know, basically. And I feel the same way about the amps. When you when you hear a guy that's really you know, Metallica guys or Petrucci, he was hanging around, and and man, these guys, the the sounds they get out of the amp are just you know, they're so cool you can't help but love them. And it was just like, so basically what I've done is I've just. I've just offered these tools out. It's those guys that have figured out how to use them and how to make them have those sounds. And then I listen to them more and listen to where the sounds go and, um, you know, just sort of keep pushing it forward. But um, uh, it's it's the players that have figured out how to make the sounds out of the amplifiers. Well, not, I'm not, me, you know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I guess I thought I had an inkling that it would come back to um, – something that was more informed for you uh, from an acoustic basis, you know, given, given your background, because, or, and I, or I had an inkling that it was going to come back to um, a very present kind of harmonic overtone yes, structure. Yes, it, so it does. I, that, it does. I, you know, that. and, and you, it's, it's, you can really hear that off of an acoustic saxophone. You can hear that off of the right singer's voice. And like you're saying, like off some, some heavy duty engines that are out there um that's one of those kind of things that a lot a lot of different uh sound sources share is when they put out the right set of overtones you know it's, it's yes. that hair on the back of the neck test that you you can feel and that that's really that's really cool to know that that's kind of what oh man i'll tell you what forming the, your process oh john petrucci spent a day hanging around with us um uh, and we were just to listen to him play through this stuff and he would do exactly what both you and I are trying to describe he he could play the most inside intimate um totally pristine clean it sounded like this should be happening in church and then it could just go into the heaviest sound and i remember he even said he said now, if that isn't the heaviest sound you ever heard, then you need to learn some new licks, you know. And I, I just thought that, and and he seamlessly did it. it. It wasn't like you know, on one hand, he was making love, and then the next time, you know, it was it was a street fight or a, or a car wreck or an explosion. No, he did it seamlessly, stylistically, so that musically, it it was it, it just you know, we were all floored. We were just, oh, man, John, geez, get down, buddy. 
it was so cool, man. So yeah, huge satisfaction. But again, he 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 was able to take both of those extremes, and and play the entire continuum from the most vocal, like you know your lover woman, you know whispering in your ear, to just this colossal raging, just explosive sound. And, and it was just it was wonderful. Ah, oh, the same amp, same guitar. Yeah, he foot switched he's it a, all right, but uh, <laughs> he's, he's a trim- Tremendous yeah. player, and obviously one of those guys that that can that can make that happen with his. Oh, playing. it was unbelievable! That was super gratifying. So, yeah. Um, well, let me see. I won't I won't keep you for too much longer. I have just a, a few more questions. And no, I go ahead. I'm enjoying this. Is oh, okay. Good. Out of time or tape, I'm yours. Okay, good. Um, well, then I'll, I'll ask you the one that is maybe flirts with being a little bit of a, a dangerously long answer, but built into my question. I'm going to see if, if we can do this without it being really long. So I came across this wonderful article that you wrote um, that I think any guitar player who is you know into their sound or their amp really needs to check out at some point, and it was called A Technical Rap for Musicians, How Amps Work and What is Class A? And um, in this article, you speak in uh, very great detail about uh, a lot of different things that have to do with, with amplifiers, and there is a, a very nice commentary about single-ended amps versus push-pull amps. Now, what I'm going to say to you is that, you know, I'm going to quote Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Absolutely. And I'm, right. I'm wondering if, if you would, would take a stab at telling the, the listeners, in uh, the simplest language that, that you can boil it down to, the, the big difference between single-ended amps and a push-pull amp. I'm glad you read that booklet because what you. Oh, well, I got to read asked, it again. Yeah, what you, <laughs> just, you what you just asked me uh, is what I was asked, and that's what directly resulted <laughs> in my spending a long time writing that that book because uh, you know to to get an answer to answer that with any exactitude and any depth really predispose uh, pre assumes that you that you that uh, the reader understands a whole lot and it's a whole yeah. lot of stuff that's taken me all my life to really understand and it helped me to understand it better but by trying to explain it there i'll see if i can make it real short cuz i agree with leonardo but that book was my attempt to make it real short but as you say one thing, you realize, yeah, but you have to explain what that is. Oh, then you have to explain. Well, then you have to explain what the difference is between voltage and current, because most people are unsure of that. Uh, and and so it just keeps backing up until you have enough background knowledge to be able to understand what it is. Yeah. One way to look at it is it's single-ended versus push-pull. In push-pull, the signal is split into two different halves that are out of phase with one another. And, of course, then it's recombined in the output transformer to be a single-ended signal again because it needs to feed the speaker, which only has two wires. I mean, the one way to look at it is two wires or three wires. There's only two wires on a guitar pickup, right, and a guitar cord. There's a ground and there's the hot. Speaker, same thing. There's a ground and they're hot. If you have a, a single-ended amplifier, it stays that way from start to finish. There's only the signal and the ground. Mm-hmm. In push-pull, the signal gets split into two different out-of-phase components. And by doing so, you're, you're able to increase the efficiency of the tubes dramatically uh, because otherwise, in single-ended, the and this only really accounts to the output section. All of the rest of the preamp stuff and all of that uh, doesn't matter because the, the voltage is high and the current is low. But when you get it, because you're not trying to deal with any wattage at all without any power, when you're trying to actually deliver power to, to make a speaker get loud enough to hear, then, then efficiency becomes a primary uh, goal. And if an amplifier stays single-ended, then it's forced to operate class A. And what that basically means simply is that it's on all of the time and that the best that it can achieve, achieve is that most of, the, most of the power is being consumed and wasted in heat and not turning into 
into audio sound. Yeah. And that's because, right. again, the current, ha- a lot of current has to flow all of the time. Now, when you put it into push-pull, you can, you can overcome that limitation and you can cut the current that has to flow through the tubes at idle way down. That enables you to, put, to increase the voltage way up without melting the tubes, and that enables you to get a whole lot more power. That's why that that's 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 what it's all about. Is that right. any clearer? Now, um, yeah, I mean, I I I feel like for me, I, I I was was grasping about that same understanding. I I felt like it would be a fun one to throw out there to to see how somebody who is so steeped in the amplifier design and building process, you know, if you're asked to boil something as complex as that topic down you know how how can you do it you know it's because like you said you have you can continuously feel the need to just keep backing it up because it's it's a lot of information that goes behind that but what what i'm i suppose i'm getting into after that is i wonder if uh to your ear you know if you have much of a preference or uh between single end the sound of a single ended amp or a push pull amp if you have either a preference or uh, something to say about the, the quality of the sound of, of those amps, the difference between them. Well, so much of it, and uh, there's so much more to it than than just the uh, output tube configuration. I'd have to say, on balance, probably my preference would would be push pull, uh, yep. because it takes it, you, you need to have ample power to be able to deliver good sound, and. Right. And uh, it's just too hard to get ample power out of single-ended. It's just too hard to do. Now, some of the most esoteric high-end audiophile stuff has come around to, you know, to, at least when I was looking at this about 10 years ago, to, to some single-ended stuff. And they're, they're juicing about, oh, the purity and all of this. And, yeah, I'm sure there's something to it. But, once again, they're up with that thing where the amps cost like $5,000 and they put <laughs> out 20 watts. And, yeah. and you know, and so the you you come up the uh, the practicality has to be figured into it at one point, seems yeah. to me. So, um, and uh, you know, like I say, you can within either either single ended or push pull. There's such a variety of, of ways it can be done and has been done that some are better than others, and some are wonderful sure. and others aren't. In both in both cases. So, what's your preference? Yeah. Nah, not. It may be it may be a, a slightly unfair question because of how many other variables are actually, um, you know, woven into the final product of any. Yeah, I'd say ninety five percent of all the amps that you've ever heard are are push pull load. Hardly, oh, I mean, yeah. even when you get down to little supros and all of those, almost all of them are push pull. You have to get yeah. down to a little little champ or something like that with one six v six to get something that's single ended. Yeah. Now we've done that with. Uh, one of our patented uh, designs. <laughs> this is one of the things that came up from swimming too. When when I was talking to Steve Mueller okay. about uh, you know our Lone Star special, I was talking about yeah you know we'll we'll make it four tubes switchable down to two tubes, mm-hmm. and uh, he said oh yeah but man and which is something we pioneered a long time ago and he said well. God, it'd be so cool if you could switch it down to one tube. And then I told, yeah. I went off on this whole riff. Well, you can't do that because it, it requires a completely different iron configuration for the output transformer. Whereas for single-ended, you, you think of a horseshoe magnet. The the uh, the transformer needs to have a gap in the iron core. But for push-pull, you don't want that gap because it won't have any low end. But because push-pull has these two out of phase components going simultaneously it doesn't need that it doesn't it won't saturate magnetically because one side is always canceling out the other side in terms of magnetic saturation so i give him this whole riff about how it's impossible to go from a two tube <laughs> to a one tube and then i'm swimming and i went but wait a minute <laughs> this was a real light came on what if you just tricked the transformer in, into thinking that the other tube was still there, even if it wasn't conducting any signal? And I literally jumped out wet and tried it, and, and it seemed to work because I could see I hope there. you dried off first before you <laughs> plugged anything in. I think I did dry off first. Okay. And, I, and again, I ran it by the transformer guy, and he went, hmm, wow, well, yeah, I don't see why that wouldn't work. And I said, it seems to because 
when I don't have the, the dummy tube hanging out there, it doesn't work for shit. But when this other tube is there, even though it's not doing anything audio, then it, it fixes the transformer problem, and it works good. And, and so I ended up getting a patent on that, and, it, and it's one of the cool things. Um, and it's in the King Snake too. When you want to turn the power way down into that ten yeah, watt yeah. position, that's single ended, and it, it sounds re- it sounds really good. And it does give you this. It's an alternate sound, you know, whether it's what you want or not. That's uh, you know, yeah, that's yeah. a matter of taste. But it's a good sound. Matter of fact, very it's the sound that when Carlos was up in our tone lounge uh, auditioning one of these protos, he was playing through that, and he didn't realize he was he, the thing was switched down to the ten watt mode, and he was going off, and he was oh man that that that's so cool and then and his guy stubby he said yeah wrap it up we'll take it and carlos said don't wrap it we're going to eat it here <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, well man you want to hear it on the 60 watt and the 100 watt position he said man wasn't that and i said no no that was this 10 watt that's something that the old your old original amp did not have but when, when right, we yeah. switch it to 60 or 100 then it goes exactly like your old amp so uh, so it must yeah. be a, a fairly screaming volume at 10 watts then. Oh, yeah, because, you know, uh, the, first of all, the 10 watts is uh, somewhere around where it begins to clip, but that's one of the characteristics of single-ended and Class A is that the clip comes on so gently that it has its own uh, overtone sequence. Now, this is one of the things about push-pull. Remember me saying that you got these two out of phase uh, halves. Well, that turns out to be one of the big measured virtues of push pull is that not only do you get this tremendous increase in efficiency and power, but you also get this great reduction in distortion because the even order components tend to cancel each other out. And then you go, but wait a minute, aren't the even order? components, uh, even order harmonics, aren't those the good ones? And the yeah. answer is yes, they are to a certain degree. But too much of them, I mean, there's still some in there, but largely they cancel out because they're equal and opposite. Uh, so that's one thing that you get, you do get when you go down to that single-ended bit is that you get the full harmonic uh, distortion spread, all of them, and a whole lot more of those those number twos and fours come in. Uh, well, what I'm going to say to our listeners is, you know, we're going to, we're going to hop off the, the push-pull single-ended <laughs> conversation. If you have not had a chance to read uh, the, the article that Randall has written, I'm going to say it again. It's called A Technical Rap for Musicians, How Amps Work, and What is Class A? And I believe you can find it on the Mesa site, but if you just were to do a search for the name of that article, you're you're going to find it very easily, and it's... I think you start off by saying, you know, pour yourself whatever your favorite drink is and get comfortable because, you know, we got a lot to talk about here, and it's a really interesting read. It really well, is. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I struggled with that, and I enjoyed writing it, and it's truly one of those things that if a guy is interested, you know, each time he reads it, he will get more out of it, and I'm using myself as a prime example. I remember as a yeah. kid trying to figure this stuff out and reading the Bible. That would be the RCA tube manual. <laughs> and and it it says all it says about class A is class A operation is such that current flows through the tube at all times. Period. Yeah. That's the yeah. entire description of it. So it's both completely simple and yet it's completely evasive because that you know that goes back to what I was saying is just like what that. I can repeat that, but I don't think I understand all of that. And you have to put it all into context and blah, 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 blah. It goes yeah, on yeah. and on. So, yeah, <laughs> I basically took that one sentence and expanded it into about 20 pages, which is what that article is. And it's accompanied yeah. by some hand-drawn illustrations that I think help the player understand because it starts off with a picture of a string vibrating, and that string vibration is almost identical to what an oscilloscope waveform looks like when you're looking at voltage. So I tried to make it so that guitar players can relate to it without having any technical background at all. Yeah, I I think I think you did a very good job at making a um you know, uh what can be looked at as a kind of a, a bit of a black magic subject, something that, you know, somebody without a, a big background can actually follow along. So yeah, job, job well done there. It's deep. Um, okay, next I, I also 
Uh, yeah, next question. I'm gonna. I got two two left for you, and and they're, they. Sh- we'll see if we can keep them. Uh, we'll we'll try to rein them in, and then uh, I'll I'll let you go back to building phenomenal <laughs> amplifiers, and you're you know, we're, we're taking a dip or whatever you're gonna do this afternoon. But um, uh, in terms of Mesa Boogie, uh, just kind of looking forward uh, over the next five years. You know, what is, what are your hopes? What are your hopes that the company will be doing um, in the in the near to grasp uh, future? Oh, I can keep this real short. More of the same. Next question. Okay. <laughs> so I'll Very elaborate well. that on that a little bit. Yeah, always irons on the in the fire. There's always amplifiers that are in various stages of development, <clears throat> and there is always ones on the horizon that we're discussing and and can't wait to get. Too. And uh, so I, I keep thinking, I keep wondering, uh, you know, well, will we ever run out of ideas and desires? And the answer so far is no, not even close. So, I mean, look at the bass amps that we just came out with. That's something I was looking forward to do for a long time, but had all these guitar amps um, that really took priority, partly because, uh, you know, there's more demand. It's about four or five times as the demand, but the, the two bass amps, the Prodigy and the Strategy, they they were a big challenge and a big satisfaction, and they're terrific. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're... I have not had a chance to, like, play out of one, but I ha- I do have them in front of me. I've taken a look at them. And, um... Well, they were a fun project. So, you know, um, there's plenty more amplifiers, guitar amps. I wish I could tell you more, but it's not a good idea to tell you about stuff until it comes around because it 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 yeah. just it creates too much confusion but basically to answer your question where do I see us going steady is the course we got the greatest crew of guys we all love what we're doing and the 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 key to our success so far is and continuing success i hope is that we haven't changed the formula it's still just a bunch of excited kids who have all grown older by doing what we all like to do, which is making these fucking hot rod amplifiers and having a great time doing it. That's it. Why do we want to? Do it? There is no desire to to go play golf with a banker and get a big loan and have a factory in in Korea or something like that. The last thing we want to do. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Then don't change a thing. That sounds like you've got a pretty you got you got your uh, your formula really well dialed in there, and I, I wouldn't want to hear that you're going to mess with that. Not then, at um, all. All right, well, Randy, I'm going to leave you with um, one more question. We're asking everybody this one at the end of uh, the interview. We've gotten to ask it to some really wonderful players uh, over the past few weeks as part of the Gold Rush promotion, and it was particularly very, very fun to ask Carlos this question, but I was just going to throw this out there one to you. What is music? What is music to Randall Smith? Oh, man, I don't want to make this a long one, but my first cognizant um, memories as a kid, as a baby, lying in the cradle were of my father playing his saxophone, followed by my sister, who was five years older and was a bit of a piano prodigy, by her playing, you know, piano, and she was playing all of the classic piano stuff that a student would play, which is great stuff, the, the Beethoven sonatas and the, you know, Mozart and all, all of the stuff that, you know, they're, they're all just timeless classics because they, they just work so well together. I mean, they're, they're just brilliant compositions. So it starts from there, you know, I, so I played sax and clarinet and flute and drums, and I've loved them all. They all have a, they all, they all are fun. They all uh, enable you to explore a different part of your psyche and, and, and plumb different emotions. Piano and, and B3, I don't play my B3 that much anymore, but I sure do like playing my piano. I just like, it feels good, man. And, and you know, I feel like I'm, I'm able to share a little bit of what these icons, like Bill Evans and Red Garland, man, you hear them, you hear their touch, and you hear their harmonic concepts, and you hear the ideas that these guys have got, and you just go, that is just sheer brilliance, you know, and just to be able to scratch the surface and, and pull the curtain back a little bit and see what those guys who have devoted their life to it and their stellar, you know, talents at it. Um, it, it it's a great feeling. You know, you know every, anybody that plays music, I don't have to explain to, to them what, what the feeling is. And uh, so that's it. You know, I mean, it's a way to indulge all your emotions, in, 
whichever ones you want, from blues to uh, to, to sad to happy, uh, and and uh, man, it's just fun. Whether you're playing with your uh, with a with a bunch of mates and and banging it out, or uh, whether you're just exploring on your own, it's it's just a great <laughs> it's a great artistic pastime. And you know what? I am truly blessed and fortunate to be able to do something that I love doing that hasn't gotten obsolete yet, like so many things do so quickly these days, yeah. uh, that that is satisfying and it provides a really good living for me and all of the mates down at the uh, at the club and the tone lounge down there and is intimately related to music. I, I couldn't be luckier, man. I, 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 I wish everybody had the opportunities that I've been able to, you know, basically wander blindly into and that that's pretty much how it happened there was no plan it's just happened so well i'm glad you've had all those opportunities myself because it's it's been a, it's a wonderful thing to have a chance to to talk to you about all these things today but it's it's a wonderful thing um your your contribution over the years to to music and to all the things that you know we as guitar players enjoy and we we love geeking out about and and it becomes such a big part of uh our own artistic expression in our own worlds, no matter what kind of music or whatever we do. So, you know, on, on behalf of every, every, you know, players everywhere that have you know experienced your your work, thank you very much for all of your your hard work and all of your great designs, and, and thanks very much for speaking with us today. My pleasure on all fronts, and especially the one uh, that you just mentioned, being able to deliver um, the goods to so many guitar players uh, who, who trust us with their tone and 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 get inspiration through our stuff. That's really gratifying. Now, it's interesting that I don't play guitar. It's a one instrument that I, you know, I can sort of fake it, from fake it to be reasonably good on a lot of instruments. But guitar, are you kidding me? That is just as foreign as it could possibly be, you know, other than being able to test amps, which I don't even do anymore with guitar. I, I, can, I can't play music out of, out of, out of, out of uh, so the, the point is that, it's extremely gratifying for me as an amp man to to hear that I'm making guitar players happy because I don't get the opportunity to play my own creations. It's the one thing that's kind of <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, I think I think you're in pretty good company with uh, you know people like Leo Fender in that regard. So well, that's true. That's a good point. He didn't play either, did he? No, I mean I think you guys are very you know you're cut from a very similar cloth. You you both came from an electronic repair background and and then you know it 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 turned into you know knowing so much about what it was you had on your hands to improving upon the designs that were available to you and then just pushing it all way forward in your own way it's a great american story leo's and mine and i give thanks every day that uh that it's turned out this way. So thank you for for all your kind words and the the job that you guys do representing us. We appreciate it and um yeah. my my sincere gratitude to all of the guitar players everywhere whether they use our stuff or if they're happy with the other guys stuff, stick with it. If they try our stuff and like it better, wonderful. So <laughs> thank you, thank you Bob. Thank you again. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Thanks very much for your time today Randy and um Gold Rush uh, participants and uh, contest entrants, thanks a lot for listening. And uh, we wish everybody luck and hope you all win very big. And uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Take care.